I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. High View, good morning. Good morning. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 2 this morning. Merry Christmas to you all. I haven't gotten to see you in a while, but I hope you have had an incredible last few days, especially as much as it is permitted in this season with your families. And it has just been a sweet time together, a sweet time to worship Christ and to think of all that he's done, but just to be together, to enjoy some really good, unhealthy food, just the whole thing. And uh, it is just always such a privilege to be with you. I hadn't been here in a while, and so I'm grateful to be here and also to wish you a happy new year. Maybe a happy, happier, exponentially happier new year. We're almost to 2021, y'all. But man, we have so much to look forward to. And one of those biggest things is, as you know, is the plant of a new campus. It's gonna be led by Pastor Scott and Brother I'm just so excited, and I hope that you are excited as well in that, and brother, I so appreciate just the kindness in your introduction. It's really overshooting it, but I know too at the same time, if this gray paint comes off the walls here at Fagenbush, Pastor Aaron's eyes are going to be filled with tears, okay? So I'm hoping it doesn't happen, Uh, but I am so grateful to serve alongside Pastor Scott, and I'll tell you what, in terms of someone who just truly walks in humility and integrity, someone who really walks in the spirit of God. Man, I look to him and look to his example. Uh, I know he would receive that in humility. And so brother, I'm so grateful to you. I'm just so grateful for our church. As difficult as this year has been in particular, uh, I hope that we've learned some big spiritual lessons. I hope even in this moment, we are recognizing how invaluable it is to be able to gather in this room of how valuable it is to be able to just shake somebody's hand, to give somebody a hug. I hope we've seen in the shakiness of our economy what we ought to really be invested in. You know the future medium of exchange is going to be toilet paper and a hand sanitizer, so I hope you're stocking up with that, right? I hope we're ready. No, but genuinely and and seriously, it's been a year of uncertainty, unpredictability, just complete chaos in every way. But maybe, just maybe, this holiday season, we're imbalanced enough that we might just really hear this story. That the haze might be lifted from our eyes like normal at this time of year, and we would hear clearly about Jesus and his rule. Because if there's one thing that is certain, it's his arrival demands from us a response. And the question is, will we see Jesus and receive him as a divine gift? Or this might sound weird, but or we will rather see him and perceive him as a threat to our lives. How will we come to the person of Christ? Let's look at this text. Matthew chapter two, would you stand with me as we read in verses one through six to begin? We'll get through verse 11 in the chapter. This is what God's word says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall become a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, open our eyes to your greatness your worth, 
your value, your goodness. You are truly great. And we want to worship you, Lord. I want to worship you. May we see you so clearly, you and your cross, Lord, that you've worked for our salvation. We thank you. Lord, pierce our hearts through your word. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Divine gift or divine threat. I want us to really think through that question this morning and we'll walk through this narrative. If you're taking notes, this is helpful, this kind of outline by which we'll pursue it. First, I want us to see that Jesus's arrival elicits a reaction from everyone. We see that in the world today, right? His identity elicits reaction. We're gonna see him one of two ways. We're gonna look then at his identity as revealed in this passage, see that his identity, when we see clearly who he is, it inspires our surrender. It inspires us to receive him as a gift. And then lastly, his glory and his glory alone awakens our worship. But we'll begin with his arrival. And really we didn't get to read Matthew chapter one, but that's what the entirety of Matthew chapter one is about. It's supposed to be read as a big deal, especially for the Jewish people that were finally receiving their Messiah. Matthew's intention is to prove Jesus is the rightful king. And if there's one thing that's absolutely unmistakable about Matthew chapter one, is that heaven has broken into earth. Everything about Matthew 1 is ridiculously, I would say preposterously even, supernatural. Y'all know we love the supernatural this time of year. We loved the supernatural glimmer in a child's eye on Christmas Eve as they look forward to Christmas morning. I know some of y'all, you so tired of the Hallmark Channel, but you know Hallmark is playing those shows again and again and again that have that flair of the miraculous as this romance is stirred up between two people. Uh, we long for that. Disney has made billions off of that. What? This longing for something that is external to us, outside of us, to reach in and save us to bring us a type of divine joy. Matthew chapter one does not invite you to ponder or fancy the supernatural. Matthew chapter one commands us to embrace it. Please do not miss this this morning. This is absolutely, I mean, God became a man. God in the person of Christ, in the incarnation, has taken on flesh and bone so that we can know who he is. We can know who God is in Christ and what he has come to do is clear in Matthew 1 to save his people from their sins. Heaven is broken through, but when heaven breaks through, when something this big happens, you know there's gonna be no small controversy. There is controversy of who Jesus is today in our nation. There is controversy across the world. There is persecution across the world at his name, just as there was. As a tiny infant, he invites himself into the record of history. He's been stirring things up from the beginning, even in his infant cries. We see that's where it picks up in chapter two. It says, after Jesus was born, after the Lord God has taken on flesh, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. That's category number one, right? Worshipers of Christ, those who have come to serve him. We don't know much about the wise men. We don't even know if there were three. Some translations call it, the Greek has it, magi. They were astrologers of some sort. We don't know how they know the star indicated the birth of Jesus. It's potential that there's a connection in a passage in Numbers 24, which was a prophecy by Balaam who was, uh, who was used in a very odd way. It's potential they knew of that prophecy. Nonetheless, we know this. God has revealed to these men that they're about to meet the king. And the star is going to lead them there. They're Gentiles. They're outsiders. They're the last people that anyone would have thought would have enjoyed the birth of the king. And this is what's crazy, is they know he's the king of the Jews. But they also, as Gentiles, know he's not just king of the Jews. He's their king. He's the king of the nations. And they have come, they have, there's no telling how far they've traveled, y'all. I mean, maybe... 
800 miles if they had come from certain parts of the Middle East where it's thought they were to arrive from. Over a 40-day trip. Now, I don't know what you're expecting if you think a king's been born and this is the king, this is the redeemer, this is the Messiah. I think you're expecting the streets to be lined, but it's as if we traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to see the coronation of a new king of England and the streets were empty. The people who should have known and been the most excited were clueless. But they're there. We're here to worship him. Where is he? And then you see the response of Herod and the religious leaders, verse three. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I think troubled, we might not feel the full weight of it. You could say Herod was provoked in this moment. But we need to know a little bit about Herod. Why would he be troubled in this moment? When we look to his rule in this part of the world, he would have been known as king of the Jews. At least he would have considered himself that. But really, Herod was more so of a puppet king of the Roman government. Rome had occupied Jerusalem and Herod what was, was called a client king of Rome. He didn't move, he didn't blink, he didn't do anything apart from the permission of Rome. He wasn't really a true king, but man, you know Herod was really enjoying the status, he was enjoying the prestige, the wealth, and the authority and the control over his life in that kingdom. But Herod may have been brilliant as a politician, as administrator, but he was a bloodthirsty kind of guy, especially at the end of his reign. What we know historically from various historians is that Herod, had an extreme paranoia about losing control of his throne. He was married no less than nine times, murdered one of his wives, murdered two of his sons, murdered multiple others, probably his family member, and anyone who had threatened his rule all to hold on to control. One, at one point, the Roman emperor Augustus said of Herod, it would have been better, you'd have been safer to be his pig than his son. This king of the Jews. Now, these wise men have just walked in, maybe to the palace, among all the palace attendants, and they've just said, where's the king of the Jews? Like he's a rodent in the palace. You see why he's provoked. There is nothing that could have provoked him more. He's unsettled because he knows he's about to get unseated. It's easy when we have such historical distance between us and the narratives of scripture to create psychological distance from especially the bad guys, isn't it? But I think in my own heart and in our hearts, if we're honest, we're a lot like Herod. And has not this year proved that to us? When we begin to lose control politically, governmentally, Economically, when we begin to lose control, we begin to fear and we get unsettled. When it seems that our supposed thrones that we sit on threaten to be removed from us, we get really uncomfortable. How much more so when the word of God enters into our lives as we're reading or it's preached or we hear it in some medium or mode, we hear God's word and it begins to confront or threaten our lifestyle, our decisions, our speech, and our sin, we get unsettled that we might get unseated. All this autonomy that we think we've had, I hope this year has shown us is all a perceived autonomy. It is illusory. We have no true control over anything. Not even our own breath. It is by the grace of God. We don't have any true throne. Just like Herod, we're kind of just like client kings. We're kind of like my daughter Tatum when she puts on her princess outfit. I think we have a little picture of her. Here she is. She's adorable, I know. She's two years old. She can't even hold the scepter the right way, but that's what makes it so cute, right? She walks around the house. She's meeting out her royal decrees. And you know what? She's adorable. And so I do most of what she says because that's fun. But at the end of the day, I bought the crown. I bought the scepter. <laughs> she can only go as far as I let her go in it. And when it's time for dinner, it's time to take the crown off. But parents, you know the hardest part is getting the crown off. It isn't the same for our lives. It's 
true as Acts 17 says, in God alone, we live, move, and have our being. We can do nothing apart from him. Truly, what the reality is, we may perceive we have control and authority. We have none. We have no throne. We're destitute. We're beggars. And we're not meant to be in control. We're meant to live a life of dependency upon the Lord. And that's what Herod is sensing and feeling, except perceiving it as a threat and not a gracious gift for his life. You see not just resistance in him, you see it in the chief priests and scribes. It says, he assembles all the chief priests and scribes of the people, the experts, right? The people who knew God's word. And he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Surely they know he, maybe he brings them all in next to him. Maybe the wise men are standing over here to the side and they come in. Here's Herod, king of the Jews. He doesn't even know where the Messiah is supposed to be born. Doesn't know the scripture at all. Calls these guys in and they rattle it off like it's on the back of their hands. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And then they quote Micah chapter five, verse two, like the Pledge of Allegiance. They know the scripture. They know the information with perfection. But here's what is so scary, y'all. They nor Herod will make the six mile trip to go see the king. Here is God right down the road and they're gonna stay at home. You ever heard that saying, no matter where you are, you're no farther than six feet from a spider? That's terrifying, y'all. I see some of y'all squirming right now and I would be too because I'm terrified, right? I think in our part of the world, in Louisville, Kentucky, you could say, no, where we go, we're no farther than six feet from the scripture. It's saturated everywhere. Jesus is in front of us more than anywhere in the world. <laughs> But are we reaching six inches to our night science stand to grab God's word and pour ourselves over it morning by morning? Will we go 60 feet across the street to tell the person who doesn't have a clue who Jesus is and what he's done, that Jesus is Lord and he's come to deliver you? Might we miss him by six miles? But I gotta tell you, this is not horseshoes or hand grenades as they say. To miss him by a little is to miss him completely. Why would they not go? Why would we ever miss it? Why would we ever not go? And the only case would be is if we thought there were more enjoyment, more security, more peace, more in just satisfaction of life in staying where we are rather than bringing ourselves and receiving him. The only reason anyone would not accept Jesus as if they see him as a threat to their own self-government. But this is why I wanna look at his identity. Because when we look at his identity, especially in this prophecy, what we see is that it's clear he's a gift to us. It's clear he's come to deliver us. His identity, when we really understand it, if we accept the word of God for what it is, it inspires us. It doesn't obligate us to surrender to him. It inspires us to do so. Herod asked them in verse four where the Christ is to be born. Of course, he's been called king of the Jews at this point. The Christ, that's just the Greek word for Messiah in Hebrew, which means the anointed one. The one who's been promised the entirety of the scripture. A fierce ruler and good and righteous king who's been promised forever. It is said that he is here and where is he found? Micah chapter five, verse two is quoted by these guys, which is written about 500 years before Jesus' birth. It says, you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. If they knew the scripture and they understood it well, not only would they expect him really to be there, but you knew that the Messiah was always promised to have humble, obscure origins. But before we go it even farther, I think this invites us into something of the identity of who Jesus is and why he's so great. As Isaiah chapter 57 says that the Lord God Almighty, he inhabits the high and holy place in eternity, but he also dwells with those of broken and contrite heart. You ever been around someone or a group of people that were just too good for you? 
Maybe their status was just too high. They, they, you know, they were too good to acknowledge you. Maybe the status of their wealth just afforded them to be able to do things and be a part of things that you just couldn't. Here the king, the Lord himself comes. There is no higher rank. There is no higher authority. There is no higher honor. And he is stooped and condescended to know you, to love you, to befriend you and me, to walk with us in poverty as he took on the poverty of human flesh. This is who Jesus is, high and holy, yet as he says, lowly of heart. But he's a ruler. From you shall come a ruler. Just because Jesus is lowly of heart does not mean he concedes any of his authority. He's the king. I don't know if we felt it the first time I said it, because I don't know if we use the word king much, but Jesus is king. And that's it. He is the ultimate and only sovereign authority and monarch of the cosmos. And he rules. And he is not just king simply in his humanity because he is the rightful descendant of David by blood, but he is king as a matter of ontology, as a matter of being as to who he is as God. He didn't simply become king. He always has been Everything he says goes, man. From the particles and the atoms that are swirling around this room, from the planetary objects that move in our solar system, nothing moves apart from the word of Jesus. And what will he use his omnipotence for? To shepherd. To walk with us. To shepherd his people, Israel. Don't you love that? the people already belong to him. To shepherd us in Jesus' power, in his control, why would we surrender? Because he is going to guide us. He is going to give us security. He is going to bring us to a fresh drink of water. He is going to protect us, to deliver us. Everything about Psalm 23 is about Jesus. Y'all know it. What's the first line? It's okay. Y'all can talk. The Lord is my shepherd. (laughs) Hear this line. I shall not want. When you know Jesus, you don't have any want in you besides wanting more of him. Why, he has come to bring a perfect contentment, a divine satisfaction, a divine pleasure in who he is. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul in his power. What is he doing? He's going to revive us. He has come to give us rest. Don't you want some rest in your trouble? He's come to bring peace. And in his power, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for his rod and his staff. They comfort us. You don't fear in any circumstance of your life when your king wields a rod that makes the universe look like a tennis ball. He is the sovereign authority and we could wish with him and pray with King David. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all of our days and we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's come to give eternal life. Jesus is a good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? John chapter 10, verse 11. He lays down his life for his sheep. Christ did not come to lie in a cradle. And I think we know that. He came to be crucified upon a cross at Calvary. And it's for this reason, the moment of Christmas is so great. It's because he has shed his blood for you and I. The punishment that fell on him at the cross has afforded us amnesty, forgiveness, reconciliation to God. Will you receive your king? The only reality of resisting him is resisting our greatest good and our greatest joy. Jesus is not here to dethrone you. You don't have a throne. He's inviting you to join 
in sitting on his. In the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. Forever. In pleasure and joy in him. When we know his identity and we see him face to face and we see what we could call all of those things together, his glory, his beauty, it awakens worship within us. We all know what happens. Herod summons the wise men, right, in verse seven, and he tells them, hey, you, you, know, you go find where the Messiah is and then we'll come worship him too. We'll come bow down too. But we all know in the room, he has ulterior motives. He's gonna come in an edict in Bethlehem that all the children die. Let this sink in. There is no neutral ground in our response to Jesus. To in any form reject or be neutral is to do violence against him. But the wise men, they're going along. Verse nine, it says, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them. It seems supernaturally like it's moving. We're not sure until it came to rest over the place where the child was. In verse 10, I cannot emphasize it enough. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. You ever gotten so excited about something? You get the the words out, man, but that's awesome. That's the construction in this sentence. It's the most awesome, awesomeest, awesome thing ever, right? I can't even describe it. What's coming out of Matthew of him trying to get us to grasp what not only they knew at this moment, but what they felt in their bones and in their soul is that they're about to meet Jesus and they hadn't even got there yet. They're already worshiping because why? This star is confirming what scripture said and they see the truth of God's word always leads us to the person of God. But this is so important that we know and understand verse 10 and their joy because it explains the worship that happens in verse 11. We can't skip over this. What is their root motivation to go worship? They want to. They can't wait to. And you don't have to force people to do things that they enjoy and desire to do, do you? You didn't have to force me to eat any pecan pie this week at Christmas, y'all. I love a strong, sweet, sugary pecan pie. I'm talking the kind that's so sweet that you gotta take a pressure washer on the plate to get all the stuff off when you're done, right? Sorry, who has ever cleaned the dishes? You better soak that thing. Have to command me to eat pecan pie? I'm already on my second piece, right? But what if you could not taste your favorite Christmas meal or food? We all know that's a popular symptom actually of the virus is loss of taste. Maybe some of you have experienced that. What if then you had to eat that pecan pie and you didn't taste it? You wouldn't care to eat any. You have no taste for it, right? You may know in all your mind that that's that's supposed to taste good. People say that tastes good. People say it's sugary, but it's just an obligation. But when your taste buds, boom, when they're awakened and they're on and you eat that piece, (laughs) there's no forcing going on. It's just all in. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Because what happens when you do is true worship, true Christianity. Worship is not a suppression of what you want most. Followed with action, that is merely rooted in obligation. That's not Christianity. Worship is no suppression. Worship is an expression of the inmost desires that have been changed supernaturally by the Holy Spirit to desire and taste only the one that you treasure and his name is Christ the Lord. (laughs) To feast upon who he is, to long for who he is. This is true worship. Have you tasted of who he is? This is no obligation. And I would urge you to know if it is viewed as an obligation in your mind, then you don't know him yet. 
I know you believe in him. Everybody I talk to believes in Jesus. Imagine that. I'm asking, if you treasure him, if you want nothing but to give yourself to him because he has just filled you with something that is indescribable in the power of a changed heart. Their souls, I believe, are already awakened as they enter. Going into the house, they saw the child. What are you gonna do when you see Jesus? Are you just gonna weep in joy? Are you just gonna exhale because it's over? Are you gonna grab hold of the hem of his garment? Are you gonna grip hold of his neck and say, Lord, thank you? I can tell you what we all will do. In Christ, we will worship him. They fell down and they worshiped him. Opening them treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Having a heart that is stirred when you see the person of his Christ and his death and his deliverance that he has provided for sin and his resurrection. And when you see him truly as the king, it requires nothing but exactly what you want and it's to give everything to him to open all of your treasures to him, to withhold nothing from him. Your gold, your frankincense, I know y'all don't have those things. Some of y'all have some frankincense because you're essential oil peoples. You may need to give that over to him and that's okay, right? We all treasure different things, don't we? I wanna make sure in all of our service to Jesus and their service to Jesus and what they're bringing him, they're not bringing Jesus gifts because he's lacking. They're bringing gifts because they're lacking. Worship is a moment of anything, not just in what we give him, but what have we have done with our bodies, Romans chapter 12, verse one. As Paul the apostle says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, by, based on the blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed to present your bodies upon the altar for whatever would be demanded. And the question is, will we lay it all down? What are you withholding from him? Where is that vulnerable area of your life that the Lord and his word seems to be threatening you, but really it's the grace of his mercy revealing to you, receive the king. Embrace his deliverance. Be satisfied in his person. Do you truly Know him, worship him, treasure him. If you do, I urge you then today to again, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and lay your life down upon the altar. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word and your goodness and your kindness and your patience toward us. And we thank you most of all for a moment which seems so long ago, but which in your eyes and your mind is simply the passing of no time at all. The birth of your son to this earth, Lord, we praise you. We struggle to believe you, Lord. We struggle to treasure you. I struggle, Lord. I wanna withhold, but I pray you would, give us such a taste of who you are that we would be willing to open our hands, Lord, and surrender everything to you afresh and new, Lord. And I pray in this room, if someone has never received you as King and as Savior, Lord, they would trust you today, Lord, that they might be made new. And I pray this in your son Jesus' name, amen.